Uh, welcome to this panel uh, where the intention, intention is to discuss aspects of the science of climate change and its consequences. Uh, the aim of this session is to raise issues and set a stage for discussion of the themes of the conference, accounting for sustainability and responsible investing. Uh, my name is Chris Easton. I'm an emeritus professor and research scientist at the Australian National University. I'm not a climate scientist, uh, but the panellists are, and obviously I'm very interested to hear what they have to tell us. Of course, why wouldn't I be interested in what they have to say since our very future depends on how we respond to these challenges. The rest of the panel does consist of three scientists, which are who, sorry, three scientists who are all experts in climate change. Uh, John Church, who's professor in the Climate Change Research Centre at the University of New South Wales. Ove, who's professor from the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence in Coral Reef Studies. <clears throat> he's also a member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and he's from the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Queensland. And the third member of the panel is Will Stephan, a colleague of mine at the Australian National University, and he's Emeritus Professor in the Fenner School of Environment and Society. Now, just a bit of background to the flavour of this conference. The Australian flavour of the panel came about because the original intention uh, was to hold this conference on the spectacular Australian Great Barrier Reef uh, with the expectation that the direct exposure to this fragile ecosystem would highlight the importance of the issues that are going to be discussed. Uh, had you been in Australia in May, I think it was May 2020 when the conference was originally scheduled, you would have also seen the devastating effect of the Australian bushfires uh, earlier that year, beginning of 2020. Um, but unfortunately, that was before COVID, uh, so we're not on the Great Barrier Reef. But the panel still retains the Australian emphasis with scientists with expertise that focuses on the Great Barrier Reef, sea level rises and serious effects of climate change on the Australian ecosystems. Of course, the science questions and issues that we intend to discuss are not limited by national waters, as is clearly demonstrated by the recent spate of bushfires, record high temperatures and catastrophic floods around the world. And the range of climate related issues is much broader than we'd be ever able to cover, uh, cover in this uh, limited time, um, but let's begin. And so to begin, John, uh, perhaps you would like to be first and begin with an overview of your area of expertise in the science of sea level rises. Thanks. Thanks very much, Chris. So the focus of my research is the ocean's role in climate, particularly climate change, warming of the oceans, and sea level rise. So I wanted to start out with, well, why do we care about sea level change? So firstly, we know that in colder periods, when there was much more ice on the earth, uh, as a result, sea levels were lower, much lower, about 130 metres 20,000 years ago in the last glacial maximum. Following this, sea levels rose rapidly at more than a metre per century for many thousands of years, with peak rates of over four metres per century. But a more important issue for us today is what about previous warm climates? What were sea levels like then? Well, sea levels were higher. For example, in the last interglacial period, the last warm period before uh, the present interglacial, sea level was perhaps five to 10 metres higher than it is today, at temperatures quite similar to those of today. So sea level changes and it can be higher. Secondly, much of the world's population lives near the coast, we're a coastal community. The latest estimates are about 270 million people live within two metres of mean sea level. Tides are off an order of a metre and storm surges can be larger. For a one metre rise in sea level, this number increases to uh, the order of 400 million. And with migration to the coast that is occurring worldwide, both in developed and developing nations, this coastal population grow, could grow to over a billion this century. And thirdly, and I'm assuming, uh, we'll talk more 
about this. There are hugely important coastal ecosystems that we all rely on, but which are also at risk. So what do we know? Uh, we know the rate of sea level rise has been accelerating since the late 19th century, during the 20th century, and over recent decades. We now, now have a reasonably good understanding uh, of that rise, particularly over the last 50 years, when anthropogenic climate change is a dominant cause of this rise. Sea level rise is already having a significant impact through increases in the frequency and intensity of coastal flooding events around the world. Sea level is projected to rise during the 21st century under all greenhouse gas emission scenarios. For strong mitigation, something consistent with the Paris targets, the rise by 2100 may be less than a half a metre, but it will continue to rise well after 2100. We will have to adapt to this inevitable sea level rise as it impacts tens of millions of people's cities and natural ecosystems around the world. In contrast, continued high emissions would see the rate of rise continue to accelerate during the 21st century, resulting in a rise of up to about a meter by 2100 and continuing to rise rapidly beyond 2100, committing the world to a rise of several meters by 2300. There are important but inadequately quantified thresholds. A global warming of more than about two, degree, two to three degrees Celsius compared with pre-industrial temperatures, remembering we'll already had about one degree of warming, would see us pass a threshold that would commit the world to a, a virtually complete melting of the Greenland ice sheet and a sea level rise of up to about seven meters from Greenland alone. The flow of ice into the ocean from Antarctica could be even larger and more rapid, but detailed long-term projections are less certain, but likely to be measured in meters also. It is also important to recognize that the uncertainty surrounding the Greenland and particularly the Antarctic contributions are essentially one-sided. They could result in much larger and more rapid sea level rise than in the current projections, but not significantly smaller rises. Crossing these thresholds for Greenland and Antarctica could occur over coming decades. This will not result in an immediate sea level rise of meters, but the impacts are essentially irreversible committing the world to meters of sea level rise over coming centuries. To avoid these worst case scenarios, impacting many hundreds of millions of people, very significant, urgent, and sustained mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions is absolutely essential. And to the extent that we fail to mitigate adequately, adaptation will be essential but unfortunately, extremely costly. I'll stop there, Chris. Okay, thank you. I'm sure we'll come back to issues related to that about the horizon that you've discussed, which at one level seems a long way off and why we should be responsible for paying for it now or accept responsibility for paying for it now. Um, but perhaps this would be a good time for uh, Ove to introduce, for you to introduce uh, your area because obviously the coral reefs are dramatically affected by rising sea levels. Perhaps the most obvious, in, uh, one of the most obvious uh, consequences of sea level rise. So, Ove. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for the invitation to be here today. You know, so by way of background, I've worked on climate change for about 35 years now, particularly in ocean ecosystems like coral reefs, which we've already started to discuss here. In addition to my sort of research interests, I've also been involved in helping produce the scientific consensus on climate change via international organizations such as the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or as it's known, 
the IPCC. Now, during that time, um, these 35 years, the impacts of climate change have gone from what I would sort of uh, venture are sort of mild horizon issues uh, to what now really feels like a full-blown planetary emergency. And I think this is where we've got to get the discussion in the mainstream because it really affects about the, you know, our appetite for responding to change. And in this context, we really uh, have to respond in the next few years, uh, getting smart on climate change or face some really serious chaos and harm uh, as a result. Now, if you're concerned about whether or not climate change has something to do to this, something to do with all of this, I draw your attention to the record fire, flood and temperature extremes of the last five years alone. These have sort of broken records. And if you're not happy with that, of course, uh, I guess you could just look at the events of last week in which North America you know, hit the highest temperature it has had uh, in, since records began. And a study in Nature that was uh, published uh, on these types of events is showing that they're 150 times more likely to occur uh, as a result of climate change than by natural causal factors. So even in my own field, um, and this really goes for all ecosystems and everything, but to really sort of focus in on the ocean, it's also facing some very serious uh, concerns. And there's a real prospect that emblematic uh, ecosystems such as the world's coral reefs will disappear on our watch. And if that happens, we lose. And, and, and this is just one change. You know, 25% of, of marine species that depend on coral reefs for survival. And this is just the beginning. And of course, the consequences of losing coral reefs is not merely losing a great dive holiday. It's um, apparent that coral reefs support an enormous number of people, something like 500 million people depend on coral reefs for food, income, and coastal protection. And many of these people are otherwise destitute uh, if they don't have these coral reefs. So let me sort of finish with three starting points, I guess, uh, from the perspective of ecosystems. The first is that dangerous climate change is here and is having major impacts on our health, infrastructure, and ecosystems. And our ability to survive really depends on two very straightforward things. The first is, as already mentioned, we have to slow the rate of climate change as quickly as possible, while at the same time, because there is climate same, there's a lag in the climate system, build the resilience into human and natural systems today for surviving tomorrow's climate extremes. I think this is absolutely, it's relevant to this particular industry, it's relevant almost to any industry. The idea that if you have a changing system and you're trying to, to work with that, it can be very damaging. Now, to do this and avoid the worst, however, will, it will be vitally important that we reduce greenhouse gas emissions to below zero by mid-century if we are to achieve the Paris climate target. That's the target that's thought to be manageable in terms of, of, of climate change. And this really means society has to draw CO2 directly out of the atmosphere with as yet to be proven technology. There's a lot of startups happening. It's, it's, it's uh, got some very um, hopeful signs, but we really need to make this happen because it's an absolute must. The third thing is, uh, and going back to something I said before, and that is that climate change will get a lot worse before it gets better. Um, the actions we take today may take several decades to actually play out. And while reducing emissions to below zero over the next few decades is crucially important, it will be equally important to ensure that people are ready for the inevitable changes that we will face as we bring the planet back to climate stability. Now, related to this is the issue of incentivizing change. What role do organizations and financial mechanisms, such as much discussed in the last couple of weeks, carbon tariffs and taxes play uh, in uh, the, the rapid transformation to a low economy, a low carbon economy. Well, given the theme of this conference, I'm going to be looking forward to hearing your deliberations about these and other issues. Thank you very much. Back to you, Chris. Okay, so, so just a quick question with respect to that. You, you emphasize the need for urgent action, and I'm not for a minute disputing that, but how do you motivate the, the general public to get behind this? 
uh, if it's government, if the solutions are government funded, it has to have popular support. And I sense that there's a lot of climate fatigue or climate change fatigue out there amongst the general public. So what do we do about that? Yes, I mean, it's a, tr it's a tricky problem. Um, you know, the best lessons are the disasters that we're having, but we don't want to make that how we bring this, this issue into the right space. I'm for one still believe that we need to cost carbon accurately and then build it into the spreadsheet that we take into account that, you know, yes, it's, it's cheap to burn fossil fuels, but the impacts of the emissions and so on are so huge and costly that if we had them in the, in the spreadsheet, then we wouldn't do it. And I think those things which are driven by markets and, and mechanisms like that, I think are going to be effective in the long run. But I mean, it's a really interesting area. And I, you know, as a biologist, I probably don't have the right to speak about this type of stuff, but it's clearly in that sector where we incentivize, drive change through sort of market mechanisms. That, that has a lot, of, a lot of hope. I think the other thing is to appeal to people's human side. And this is where children being affected by climate change become really important. It's very compelling to, to have a child realize that by 30 years from now, we might not have a Great Barrier Reef anymore. You might not have the pleasure and the, the, the awe of this wonderful thing. Those, I think we have to use more. And again, it's almost bringing the emotional side of this issue into the spreadsheet. So it's better spreadsheets. It's ideal for care. Okay, thank you. I'm sure that gives the conference participants uh, something to think about. And so now I'd like to move on to Will uh, and with respect to uh, discussing impact of climate change and tipping points on the Australian ecosystem. Thank you, Will. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, first of all, just a general uh, introduction as to what tipping points actually are. Uh, and they are features, uh, components of the Earth system uh, that have thresholds. John has already mentioned uh, a couple of examples in terms of large ice sheets. Ova's already mentioned an example in terms of a, a biome, a marine biome, the Great Barrier Reef and so on. But basically these are parts of the Earth system that once you reach a critical level of human pressure on them, uh, you cross a threshold and the internal dynamics of these uh, features take over and they basically shift to either a different mode of operation or a different state. <clears throat> they generally come in three different types. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, ice is one of them, and that includes uh, the large ice sheets of Greenland uh, and Antarctica, but it also includes the floating ice uh, on the Arctic Ocean, which is actually another important part of the Earth system. Uh, it consists of large biomes. We've mentioned the Great Barrier Reef, uh, but there's some big ones on the terrestrial side of things um, and those are the Amazon rainforest and the large so-called boreal forests uh, in northern uh, Canada and Siberia. Those two store a lot of carbon, uh, so they have feedbacks if we cross tipping points there. Uh, another one not well known globally, but here in Australia, our eastern Australian broadleaf forests also have a tipping point, and that's an example of a tipping point that was crossed in 2019-2020. Uh, and the third thing, our circulation patterns also have tipping points. Uh, two examples of that are the uh, north-south uh, ocean circulation in the Atlantic Ocean, which is already showing signs of slowing down, uh, and also atmospheric uh, circulation patterns. Probably the most well-known one there is the uh, jet stream in the northern high latitudes. Well, what are the consequences of tipping these things? Well, we've already seen the consequence of tipping uh, the Eastern Australian broadleaf forests. Normally, uh, about 2% of them burn in any year. They are a fire prone ecosystem. Uh, but in 2019, 2020, that jumped in one season from 2% to 21%. Uh, and, and that surprised uh, everyone, even the fire ecologists. Although interestingly, CSIRO had predicted this could happen. Uh, that prediction was actually made 30 years ago. Uh, so that's an example of uh, not just going from 2% to, to 4 or 5%, but going from 2% to 21%. That's a good example uh, of a tipping point. Uh, the consequences, obviously we saw the consequences in Australia of these massive fires. Uh, but one of the things I'm interested in are consequences for the earth system if we tip some of these. A good example of that would be the uh, summer sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. That's ice that floats on the surface of the Arctic Ocean. And during the Northern Hemisphere summer, it gets sunlight uh, 24 hours a day. 
uh, with a full ice cover that reflects that sunlight so it keeps the place cool. But as that uh, ice is melting and contracting year by year, it's absorbing more of the uh, summertime sunlight that tends to heat uh, the northern high latitudes even more, which then has implications for the Greenland ice sheet. That's one of the contributing factors uh, in terms of the acceleration of that ice sheet and so on. So these things are linked. Uh, as the Greenland ice sheet melts, it's pouring uh, fresh water on the North Atlantic Ocean. That influences the circulation of the Atlantic Ocean. And interestingly, as the Atlantic Ocean slows down, uh, rainfall is decreasing over the Amazon forest. Uh, and that plus direct human um, perturbation of the forest, deforestation, uh, is pushing that forest up perhaps towards a tipping point. Uh, so these are, this is complex science. It's science that I don't think we'll ever be able to predict very, very accurately. Uh, we can certainly give you ranges, and John did that already uh, for the Greenland ice sheet. Um, so I think the way we need to handle this is to use a risk assessment to say we certainly don't want to go close uh, to where those tipping points might lie, which is another, I think, extremely important motivation uh, for trying to meet the Paris targets as, as best we can. Um, how close are we to tipping any of them? Uh, estimates are that the um, floating sea ice in the Arctic Ocean could be vulnerable between one and two degrees of warming. We're already at about 1.2. So there are some projections that we could see an ice-free Arctic Ocean by mid-century. Um, West Antarctica, again, that's thought to be uh, fairly vulnerable at a one to two degree temperature rise. As John mentioned, Greenland, maybe two to three degrees. Uh, so these can act like a row of dominoes. So if we start tipping the first ones at, at one degree or, or one to two degrees, uh, we could get knock on effects. So this is the real ultimate challenge uh, is to understand how these are, are related. And I'll conclude by what I think is the best uh, quote on, on tipping elements that I've heard. And it's come from a colleague of mine named Carlos Nobre, who's a Brazilian scientist, former chair of the World Climate Research Program. And he's an expert on the Amazon forests. And uh, Carlos was asked, uh, where do you think the tipping point lies um, uh, for the Amazon and how are we gonna find out? And he says, well, the only way we're gonna know for sure where that tipping point lies is by tipping it. And then he added, that's not a terribly intelligent thing to do. So I think that's, that's the, the uh, challenge that we face. Uh, there's enough science out there that we know that these tipping elements exist. Uh, there's paleo evidence that they have existed in different states in the past. Uh, we're getting much better handle on what range of temperatures might tip these, but we will never know precisely where they lie. So our challenge, I think, is to take a risk averse approach uh, and get our emissions down uh, and stabilize the climate system just as fast as we can. Okay, thanks very much. You provide a nice balance of uh, definite tipping points, but some range of uh, uh, where they might occur. You mentioned a specific tipping point of the broadleaf plants in uh, Western Australia in 2019. Why is that specific and how much range is there you know, likely to be in some of these other tipping points and, and how do non-experts get evidence from that, about that? Well, in, term, in terms of the Eastern uh, broadleaf force, uh, after they've tipped, we can actually work backwards and uh, there's, a, there's some very good research groups here in Australia, one at University of Wollongong, who's done that. Uh, and it was a combination of 2019 being the hottest uh, year on record here in Australia since the Bureau has kept records. But 2018 and 2019 together were the two driest years on record. So when they tracked uh, the conditions of those forests, um, they saw that they were creeping up towards unprecedented conditions in terms of vulnerability to fire, uh, to, to, to burn. And they saw that in 2019, uh, they actually crossed uh, two orders of magnitude uh, from the median, which they thought was a, a good uh, measure of the tipping point. Now, that's a good example of after the fact, being able to track back um, and see what actually happened to those forests and what the antecedent conditions were. It's much more difficult to actually predict uh, what some of these complex, when some of these complex systems are going to tip, uh, and, and hence the need for a risk analysis and a risk averse approach to them. Thank you. And, and, and just perhaps a follow up question. You're obviously very familiar with all of this uh, information. How does a non expert, perhaps somebody that's out of the science discipline, get hold of reliable science and uh, 
distinguish that from misinformation? Well, the first place I'd go to would be the, the IPCC, which in fact, uh, in the 2018 special report, uh, listed some tipping points that they thought were, they judged as moderate risk of tipping uh, between the one to two degree range. Well, that's based on a synthesis of a very large body of, of peer reviewed literature. Um, I understand, although I'm not sure that the IPCC is certainly considering, if not has actually agreed to do a special report in the next few years on these tipping points and tipping elements. Um, uh, in addition to that, you can go to the peer reviewed literature. There's a lot on that. Uh, with these modern search tools, you can get on top of it. Uh, search Greenland ice sheet tipping point or something, and you'll get a lot of uh, a lot of peer review, reviewed literature on that. Okay, thank you. Would you like to comment on that, Ove, as a member of the IPCC? Well, actually, I was going to comment on on the fact that Will is part of an organisation which produces very digestible reports on climate issues in Australia. So while it might have an Australian focus, it is really a good way of getting across some things. So I'm just referring to the the Climate yeah. Council, Will. Yes, You're thank being you. too shy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think from the IPCC's point of view, there's a real realisation that um, there's got to be more effort put into communication of, of ideas. And so the last couple of assessment reports, which is really big global sort of meetings and consensus, has had a group within that um, uh, deliberately trying to digest and create uh, easily read and, and understood uh, sort of parts uh, of, of the of the information set so um, so I think there's a real realization that that the reports are great but if we're not getting over and influencing people in business and governance and the general population then it's uh, far diminished in its potential impact okay thank you so I'd just like to open up the discussion now uh, more generally and uh, invite all three of you to uh, ask questions of each other or prompt discussion among each other. Um, but perhaps to begin with, I could go back to some comments that you made, John, at the start. You talk about inevitability and need to adapt. Uh, somewhat facetiously, why don't we just adapt and that's it? Why, why do we need to do anything but adapt? As I say, it's a somewhat facetious question, but. Right, okay, uh, thank you for the question. Let me first start though by um, reinforcing O's message. Uh, the most reliable place for getting information is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. The reports are huge, but there are uh, much briefer summaries and special products aimed at a broader audience. And it's the one way you can be guaranteed of uh, getting sound scientific information. Okay, why do we need to adapt? Uh, or why can't we just adapt? Um, yeah, so we're experiencing the impacts of sea level rise now around the world, east coast, west coast of the US, uh, around Australia, etc. But adaptation is expensive and it impacts people. At the moment, we've experienced something like a 20 centimetre sea level rise over the last century. But with uh, unmitigated emissions, we're, going to, we're talking about a metre this century and several metres over coming centuries. You're now talking about a billion people. Would any country be willing to take large number of climate refugees? Um, you know, Australia lies just south of the most vulnerable area in the world, South Asia and East Asia. That's where the predominant number of people living in these very low lying areas are. They, with these larger rises, they will be forced to move. So where are they going to go? They're going to come to Australia or they're going to stay in their own country. Either way, there will be major conflict resulting from that. So it's a long-term issue, I know, uh, but it is something that will be inevitable if we don't act. 
And not only do we have to act, it's absolutely urgent because we are setting in train now processes that will play out over, over decades and centuries, impacting many, many people. Right. Okay. So, I mean, perhaps, um, I mean, we've discussed uh, sea level rises, effect on coral reefs, uh, bushfires, temperature change, etc. Um, but, I mean, I just wondered with respect to, and, and maybe I was, uh, I, well, there are other aspects of climate change, perhaps outside of the area, specific areas of expertise that uh, the three of you focus on. But uh, what, what's the effect on uh, agricultural systems, on human health of other extreme, extremes of climate change? Uh, Will, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, yeah I'll just comment on, on that last one because um, we now have two or three councillors for the Climate Council who are experts on uh, human health and the impacts of climate change on that. Uh, there's some obvious ones that, uh, uh, that are related to extreme heat. Uh, our bodies operate at about 37 degrees Celsius. When you put in 40 plus degree uh, conditions uh, for a long period of time, uh, there are severe health impacts. If you don't take the appropriate measures, uh, people can die. Uh, we saw that in, in a heat wave in Victoria. Uh, it's now a, a decade and a half or so ago, um, but, un, but uh, excess deaths are on the order of nearly 400. Uh, over a, about a 10 day period of excess heat. Um, obviously extreme weather events can, can uh, damage people, whether there's severe flooding. Uh, just look at what's happened in Germany. Uh, the, the number of people have lost their lives on, uh, because of that. Uh, and there are long-term health issues because there are secondary effects of the impact of climate change on infectious, infectious diseases, on disease vectors, uh, on, on uh, phenomena like that. So it's becoming a rapidly well-studied area. Uh, and uh, that's one of the, uh, I think, the issues that's a, still a little bit under the radar screen. Uh, but you ask, why not just adapt? Uh, well, if we're going to just adapt, we have to put a lot more effort into our medical system, into our health system, into our preventive health system, and so on. Uh, and that's going to cost money, and it's going to cost lives, and, and so on. But if you want to just adapt, uh, then health is going to be a huge issue to deal with. Okay, thank you. And what, and what about possible effects on food supply, food chains, uh, changes to growth periods? Yeah, I think you'd have to talk to some other experts on that. I'm not uh, an expert on that. Uh, but from what I do understand is that anything much above a one degree temperature rise, uh, food systems will have increasing difficulty uh, to cope with that. Um, we saw it with the millennium drought here in Australia. Um, our food production went down. We're normally an exporting country. Our exports dropped. Uh, it saved, shaved about half of uh, a percentage point off our GDP, uh, which is actually significant when you actually convert that to dollar amounts. But the real problems are in the developing countries or the poorer countries, uh, perhaps in Africa and countries like that where rainfall patterns are shifting as they are here. Uh, and it's much more difficult for them to adapt than it is for us to adapt. Uh, so yes, food, um, food systems are uh, going to be important. Um, uh, a good example of that was the, the Middle Eastern crisis of a few years ago. Um, that coincided with the millennium drought here. And Australia is a major um, exporter of food. When those drop, food prices spiked. Uh, that was one of the contributing factors to that that led to riots in the Middle East and so on. So there are some trails of, of influences of climate impacts on food systems that are already out there in the literature. But again, if we don't get this under control, as John and Ove have pointed out, uh, these uh, impacts are going to escalate non-linearly uh, and become uh, extremely difficult to adapt to or cope with. Chris, I wanted to just add, we, we are already adapting, of course, in many ways. Uh, agriculture and in my own area in, in protecting the coast. So we have things like the Thames Barrier and the, uh, uh, the dikes in, in Netherlands and the uh, protection for Rotterdam. So these are ways of adapting and protecting parts of the coastline. But we can't do that everywhere. It's just too expensive. We don't have the resources to be able to do that everywhere. So it's not one or the other. We definitely, it's urgent that we mitigate to avoid the worst case scenarios, 
but we are still going to have to adapt uh, to that part of climate change, which we can no longer prevent. Thank you. Uh, Ove, would you like to comment on those issues? It's a slightly related issue, and that is that um, I think we have moved from maybe 10 years ago where we thought, okay, well, there's the, the sort of threshold at which we've got to really start taking care of climate change to get to sort of low zero carbon by mid-century uh, was still lots of time in there and so on. When in fact, I think we're in a world today that every ton of CO2 being put into the, uh, into the atmosphere is a real cost that's, that's mounting. And that sort of intensity of the cost goes up as we move away from where systems are most comfortable. So if you're looking at um, agriculture or ecosystems or even you know, the way uh, cities work, you're moving away from conditions where you've got some possibility of adapting. And so I think we've got to realize that we're in a world now where every day, every ton of CO2 uh, that we, we put into the atmosphere and so on is really hurting us. So if that should drive a much earlier drawdown. And many of us believe, for example, that we should be at zero, um, uh, zero emissions by 2035, and that we should be really seriously halfway down there by 2030. And I think that is when you look at the, the scientific studies and so on and look at the costs, it makes perfect sense that we've got to you know, change this. Now, this won't be good for certain industries. You know, if you're into oil and gas exploration and, and, and production and so on, refining, uh, you are going to be phased out as quickly as possible under, you know, a model that's of minimal harm. And I think these are difficult questions. But on the good side, I think we are starting to see business come around the table, um, you know, with governments, with people to make the sort of deep cuts that need to be made. And I think we've got to look to that, that, that leadership side is so important now. Um, and I think that's in a way being driven by the disasters. We're, we're now catching up with our imaginations. What was sort of scary and nightmarish is now reality. And I think that's where we, we should do more effort. So, so are the so solutions just to adapt, reduce carbon dioxide emissions uh, as the technologies available for reducing carbon dioxide? And, and what about sort of other extreme solutions that have been suggested? I mean, I know there's one extreme which involves blanketing the earth uh, with a chemical umbrella to stop the heat getting in. I mean, you know, what, do you have any comments on those? Well, I think humans have proved that they don't, they're not really good at controlling the climate in a positive way. So letting us out there with um, untested technologies, I think would be a big mistake. That said, we do have to think um, outside the box. I mean, at the moment we're seeing on my favorite ecosystem, corals um, declining very rapidly. Uh, all that we've tried to over the last uh, 20 years, we've, we've understood this to be a problem. We are still not winning the war. In fact, by you know, a few more decades, there'll be 10% you know, of the corals we had uh, you know, today um, on reef systems. So we've got to, I think we've got to face up to the fact that um, our current approaches to adapting are not working. And that should spur us on to either cut emissions much more rapidly or do both. Invest in some of these off the wall sort of ideas with the idea that you test them and if they fail, you hope they fail fast and then you get on with the next innovation. And so in many ways, that's where the challenges lie in terms of adaptation uh, when it comes to things like ecosystems, at least. So, so where do we need more innovation? Who's going to find those solutions and who's going to pay for it? Well, I think if you put a price on carbon, then and say, here is what we want uh, out of the system, uh, and you get that into the, the sort of a market at atmosphere, then I think you can uh, rapidly, well, I'm not going to put my bet on it, but you've got a chance to uh, turn this around um, if you can properly incentivize a market-based approach. Now, not everybody believes in markets as the best way to approach this. It may be that we'll get to a point where we can no longer depend on markets because they won't, they, won't, they won't come around fast enough. Um, 
but in the meantime, I think there is there is some room for developing new technologies uh, that that compete with each other to to refine it. You know, so if someone does eventually, for example, crack direct air capture at scale, um, they just based on the current markets at the moment, I mean, they would be big winners. There's a there's a lot at stake here in terms of what you can earn from being harvesting CO2 out of the atmosphere. That would be a really good outcome. But of course, at the moment, those things are not scalable. There's lots of hope, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 a very interesting space to be in. We've got to innovate, but at the same time, we've got to have lots of performance on existing approaches. So I, I agree with that. The biggest step forward is putting a price on carbon and making that right across the world. So everybody acts taking account of that impact of carbon. But beyond that, you know, we've got actually already lots of ways we can be more efficient in our use of energy. And that's, that's the step that is benefit to all of us. It's a net saving in costs by having uh, energy efficiency mechanisms. And we have a lot of that technology. Sure, there'll be more to come along, but we already have a lot. Of it. And there's already new technologies for ch changing our power supply systems. We've seen rapid advances in solar and wind energy, um, which now are being uh, firmed by using batteries or hydropower. So again, we actually have a lot of technologies. Again, there'll be new tech technologies that come along which will improve it. But we can actually make a long, useful step with what we've got already. Agriculture is going to be one of the most challenging issues, I think. We will still want to eat. We'll still want to eat uh, good food. And agriculture has uh, emissions that are a consequence of, of it. Uh, again, we will need to invest in technologies that reduce those emissions. Geoengineering, I think I agree with over. I'm very nervous about us trying to get into geoengineering. I know there is research going on around the world. I know when I was chair of the World Climate Research Program, it's one of the big issues. Should we be investing in geoengineering? Uh, so yes, I guess we should be involved in the research, but I'm very cautious about us implementing it. Here's a very complex system, as Will said, which we only have a, uh, an inadequate understanding to be actually reaching in and saying, we're going to tweak some of the parameters uh, in the climate system. We've done that with CO2 and we're seeing disastrous consequences to think we can get it right with geoengineering, I'm cautious, but we probably need to keep our eye on it. So a lot of this is going, like a price on carbon, is going to have to be driven by government regulation uh, and therefore popular support. Um, on, in this regard, perhaps I'm embarrassed to be an Australian because we seem to be behind international action on climate change, um, but, uh, how do, how do we get, uh, or how can government be driven to give this a high priority? I mean, there's obviously a lot of other priorities, not least of which is going to be dealing with this coronavirus now. Yeah, just a quick comment there. I, I think there is growing support uh, in many sectors of society for vigorous action on climate change. I'm not just talking about a scientist or uh, maybe some people out in the street demonstrating. I'm talking about the finance sector, for example, uh, because they see um, that there is no future in any further investment in fossil fuels. In fact, they're rapidly seeing there is a future in getting out of them even before some of the lifetime of the fossil fuel infrastructure is, has played out. Uh, and that's because of the enormously rapid drop in price or cost of alt alternates like the renewable uh, energy sources and so on. Uh, they're seeing batteries uh, drop enormously, electric vehicle prices are dropping enormously. So I think we're at the 
uh, maybe not just at the beginning, but going further into a technological revolution too, toward electrification uh, based on, on renewable systems. So this isn't just sort of um, idealistic stuff that we're pushing here. Uh, when you see the major finance uh, sectors getting involved in this, you know that it's got legs and you know it's going to go forward. So I'm optimistic that um, if we can, in a way, just get government out of the way, uh, we can make some rapid progress here that's going to benefit us all economically as, as, as well as environmentally. Do you have a comment on that, Ove? That sounds very promising. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I, and I think, you know, the, the problem is, is large. When you start to talk about 8 billion people on the planet in a few decades to electrify it, it, it does sound almost like it is impossible to get to those, that level. On the other hand, we've seen the uptake of, of um, solar in Australia break all records. You know, so there are all the signs, I guess. I mean, ultimately, um, we just have to keep in mind, I mean, I, uh, you know, there are some problems like um, saving the Great Barrier Reef isn't a case of, of going out and planting corals on, on the reef. It's just too damn large. It's the size of Italy. Uh, in terms of, of the, the project that one might have to re, repopulate the reefs that have lost their coral. So there are some that we need to take on board and say, look, uh, there may be uh, maybe these avenues that we've chosen uh, are, are not going to scale in the time needed uh, for them to scale. And so we should move on to look at other, other, other issues. I mean, for example, it may be that in the case of ecosystems being so large across the planet and so deeply affected, is that we need to sort of take an approach that looks at once we've stabilized the climate, how can we best get the reef, the uh, repopulation of these, these uh, ecosystems again and get them to grow back into places? Because there's one thing about coral reefs, and that is that uh, if you knock them over with a big storm, uh, they will grow back in you know, 15 to 25 years. So you do get your coral reef back. The only trouble is at the moment is we're getting rolling impacts that keep on pushing coral reefs further down in terms of abundance. So in this case, um, I think um, it may be with the Great Barrier Reef, it's about identifying those regions which are least vulnerable to climate change and then making sure that they're in a good circumstance to, uh, to repopulate reefs uh, and not be killed by pollution and overfishing and all the things that 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 are non-climate related hazards. So I mean, it's a really interesting area. You know, what are we trying to do? We have to look. We have to look long term. There's no doubt about it. But we've also got to be sort of realistic about how we can approach things. But then, of course, not being ambitious enough could be also something we've got to avoid. So it's a really complex area. And but I take Will's point. I mean, there are some amazing things happening in and finances and, and driving forward innovation that is taking up the problem at scale in, 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 in cases. Thank you. So I'm conscious of the time. So what I'd like to do now is just invite each of you to provide any closing remarks uh, that you would like to make. And in, in particular, to pose any questions that, or uh, raise any matters that you think that the conference participants in finance and accounting uh, might put their minds to. Um, so perhaps we'll change the order. I'll throw you into it. Ove, would you like to start with this? Oh, thanks very much, Chris. Look, I, I really, this has been a very fascinating discussion and, and it's, uh, it's been very enlightening. Um, I mean, if I think about the sort of three things that, that uh, I think we, we have to do, and it has to be, you know, all hands on deck. And that, that is the first is that moving to zero carbon as quickly as possible is an absolute must. I think that this is um, also then, um, I think we have to work out as we've just been discussing, um, the compelling ways in which we can incentivize a, a society's transformation. There is a huge opportunity here. We're a very advanced society uh, at a planetary scale in terms of, of um, what we have at our fingertips. You know, we've, we're, We've got supercomputers in our pockets. We've got the ability to, to brainstorm solutions across the planet in light speed and so on. This is an extremely important time in which we could uh, turn this around. And I think, um, you know, I, I think the, the optimism that uh, Will expressed is, is really important here. There's an opportunity to harness 
the best of humanity, the best technologies and so on to solve this problem. But I think the, 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 the third point and the last point I, I think is that we must double down on our commitment to providing businesses and people and communities with the tools uh, to adapt to change. And I think if you look at the recent sort of extremes from the firestorms, the European floods and so on, um, I think, you know, it may be that we've been a little bit, um, how would I say, it, dangerously conservative in our estimates of the impacts of climate change. And we need to make sure that we don't lose the war. So it's really important that we, um, you know, empower people to, to solve this problem together. So I think um, they're really the, uh, the major points that I would uh, suggest um, come out of this from the ecosystem point of view. Um, it's really clearly a time when we've got to tackle these challenges at scale and, and with the full force of, of our communities and so on. Th and thanks very much, Chris. Thank you, particularly for the positive outlook. outlook. Uh, John? Uh, so I'd like to reinforce the message that uh, we will have to mitigate and it's urgent because of the long-term consequences. Uh, and the adaptation is going to be costly. So the questions I've really got to the conference participants will be, how will we plan responsibly for this? Nationally, intergenerational, internationally, and how will we consider intergeneration, intergenerational equity? How much will adaption costs, and how will we distribute these costs? Firstly, between those people that live on the coast and those people who actually don't live on the coast but benefit from the, uh, the benefits that the coast provide our society. And then secondly, between those of us who are essentially responsible uh, for this crisis that we're in and uh, some of the inno innocent victims who will have to ro relocate becoming essentially climate refugees. How do we do this balancedly? And thirdly, between the current generation and future generations, the issues of uh, intergenerational equity. Uh, these are all big issues uh, and they probably need to be broken down into smaller components that we can tackle. Thank you very much. That's certainly a lot to think about. Will? Yeah, look, I, I think, I would just like to summarise by saying I think we're really in a in a race against time now, uh, as uh, Ove pointed out and John pointed out. The impacts are really starting to pile up, perhaps even more severe than we would have anticipated a decade or so ago, uh, with the fires, with the bleaching, with the uh, massive flooding, and so on. So clearly, the Earth system is sending us a message that it is being destabilised at a fairly rapid rate, and at the same time, uh, solutions are coming online. Things are starting to move in the finance sector, the tech sector. Uh, students are up in arms about their future, quite rightly, and so on. Uh, and I think, uh, as I talked about a, lo a lot about tipping points, some of my social science colleagues say there are also social tipping points uh, that have occurred when you look back in history of societies and civilizations and so on. So I think the real question I would face to the other, uh, to the participants in this conference is, what will it take uh, to really achieve a social tipping point towards a much more sustainable future. What will it take to get there? Uh, what sort of pressure points do we need to put on, on the social system to achieve this? And can we do it in time uh, to really stabilize the climate system within the Paris, uh, Paris goals? Thank you very much. So just in closing this panel session now, uh, it reminds me to thank the speakers, John, Ove and Will. Uh, and also note the importance of the conference, which was highlighted to me by some comments of the uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, of our Conservative government a few days ago. For those of you in the, Northern, uh, in the United States, our Deputy Prime Minister is equivalent to your Vice President. And he said he would liken climate change and addressing climate change to a menu at a restaurant. And his exact words were, show us what's on the menu and show us what it costs and we'll decide whether we're going to eat it. So essentially, uh, right down the 
targeted uh, reason for this conference, show us the costs. <laughs> and we hope that you can have a productive week and can provide us some feedback on those issues. Uh, again, thanks to speakers, and I'll close this panel session. Thank you. Thank you.